um, I'm, I'm happy to welcome you all. Uh, so in terms of the agenda for today's session, uh, we'll first begin with uh, a short presentation, uh, which is a summary of our uh, research, a paper that we are going to launch uh, shortly and will be available on our website. And we'll follow it up with a panel discussion. And we have three very interesting uh, panel members uh, who have been working in this space uh, for a long time now. Uh, so before we get into the panel discussion, though, I'll hand it over to Deepak to make the presentation. Deepak, over to you. Oh, thank you, Hemant. I'm sharing my screen. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Thank you, Hemant. I welcome you all to our webinar on assessing India's underground CO2 storage potential, a critical analysis of what lies beyond the theoretical potential. Uh, CEW, or the Council on Energy, Environment, and Water, we are among Asia's leading policy research institution. We use data, integrated analysis, and strategic outreach to explain or change the use, reuse, and misuse of resources. Uh, broadly, we work across three verticals, which are transformations, quality of life, and enablers. Within transformation, we work on aspects like low carbon economy, energy transitions, power market, industrial sustainability. This is a team where I work in sustainable livelihood. Within quality of life, we work on clean air, sustainable water, food systems, cooling, mobility. Uh, in terms of enablers, we work on sustainable finance, technology future, circular economy, climate resilience, international cooperation. As of today, we are 200 plus multidisciplinary team. Uh, we, are, we have worked in 22 states in India. We also have special initiatives like CW Center for Energy Finance, uh, Powering Livelihood, uh, Emerging Economies, and we all have a dedicated UP state office. Now, CO2 can be sequestered across broadly across four different types of reservoirs. Here we have shown five applications of CO2. Uh, the first is uh, the use of CO2 sequestration. The first, the first is to use uh, CO2 sequestration uh, for enhanced oil recovery here, which is so shown in serial number one. So in case of offshore fields, the CO2 is injected in underground reservoirs and you get oil and gas along with certain amount of entrapped CO2 as output here. Likewise, in onshore field two, CO2 can be used for enhanced oil recovery, which is shown here. Uh, the other application for CO2 is, uh, you know, the, the other way of sequestering CO2 is uh, using CO2 uh, uh, for, you know, so storing CO2 in deep saline uh, formations like an uh, offshore uh, and onshore uh, uh, reservoirs. So here, for example, in case of offshore reservoirs, CO2 is stored underground in uh, saline formations. In case of off, uh, onshore reservoirs, uh, CO2 is stored underground here uh, under, you know, saline aquifers. The third is, you know, CO2 can also be stored in uh, depleted oil and gas reservoirs, which is shown in serial number three here. Uh, CO2 can also be used for enhanced, just like you know, enhanced oil recovery. CO2 can be used uh, for enhanced coal bait uh, methane recovery here, where, where you know we put CO2 underground and we get uh, coal based methane here at the output. CO2 can, and you know, the the, the, the top four uh, CO2 sequestration methods that we have seen so far, they are based on a uh, gaseous storage of CO2. However, there is another uh, method which is you know CO2 injection in basalt formation. So here, CO2 it is injected underground. It reacts with certain you know, alkali material underground, it is, and then it is converted into uh, minerals, which is called as mineralization. Now, unlike the other four applications here, CO2 is converted into minerals, which means the risk which are associated with the leakage of CO2, etc., are significantly minimized here. Now, you now going to the theoretical CO2 sequestration potential in India. So here, the you know, as per our assessment, the total theoretical CO2 storage. A capacity in India is around 649 gigatons. And as you can see here on the left, broadly these are in saline formations and basalts. Uh, the oil and gas fields, they have a total theoretical CO2 sequestration capacity of about 2.6 gigatons, whereas the coal fields have a capacity of around 4 gigatons. And you know, just to put things in context, uh, the total CO2 sequestration potential uh, in India is about 649 gigatons. And you know, India emits about three gigatons of CO2 every year. So you know, uh, broadly that uh, we uh, we have you know significant more CO2 uh, you know storage potential as compared to our annual emissions. On the right, we show the the geographical mapping of the CO2 sequestration reservoirs. 
so here we have shown oil and gas fields in orange. Uh, the coal fields, uh, they are shown in uh, uh, black. Uh, the saline aquifers, they are shown in uh, uh, blue, whereas you know, the, the basalts, which you know, store CO2 in the form of minerals, it is shown here in gray. Uh, in terms of basalts, you know, we can see that the states of Maharashtra, the states uh, Madhya Pradesh and Gujarat, they have significant uh, you know, basalt uh, CO2 sequestration potential uh, in basalts. Now, you know, what, we show, what we saw in the previous slide is the theoretical CO2 storage capacity, but then the, the underground CO2 storage capacity is significantly limited due to above ground challenges. And these above ground challenges are in the form of you know, no-go zones here, which are shown on the right. So you know, although there is significant offshore uh, CO2 sequestration potential in India, the amount of CO2 which can be stored is significantly reduced because of no-go zones offshore. And likewise, onshore, you know, uh, the, the storage potential is reduced because of built up area. For example, we can't, you know, do a CO2 sequestration in Delhi, even though there might be some potential available. Uh, we can't, likewise, you know, we can't uh, store CO2 in heavily forested areas because we don't want to cut down on forests just to sequester CO2. So broadly, there are multiple uh, above ground challenges which significantly reduce the underground CO2 storage potential. And you know, as we saw in the first slide, the total uh, CO2 storage capacity in India is 649 giga, uh, gigatons, which is the theoretical potential. But due to above ground challenges, you know, just like no-go zones, for example, which reduces the total CO2 sequestration potential about 115 gigatons, then in a heavily populated area, if we consider a cutoff population density of about 2,000 people per square kilometer, then the, the sequestration potential reduces by about 176 gigatons. If we also you know, ignore the CO2, which can be sequestered in fallow lands and plantation, et cetera, the CO2 sequestration potential reduces further by about 41 gigatons. In croplands, the total CO2 sequestration potential in India is about 216 giga, gigatons. However, it is possible to have CO2 sequestration in uh, croplands if you know, issues related to not in my backyard, which is NIMBY, uh, is taken care of. Plus, you know, farmers are also adequately compensated uh, for the CCS projects. And finally, if we remove all layers, we are looking at the total constraint potential of about 101 gigatons of CO2, which is you know, even higher considering that the total annual emissions from India is just about you know, three gigatons. But you know, the, there are two extremities here. The extremity on the left here, it shows the total theoretical CO2 sequestration potential. The extremity on the right here, it shows the total constraint potential which is possible the actual uh, the realistic you know co2 sequestration potential will be somewhere in between these two extremities so what we show here on the left is a theoretical co2 sequestration potential which is about uh, 649 gigatons out of uh, 649 gigatons about you know, 180 gigatons is offshore uh, co2 sequestration potential whereas you know about 469 gigaton is the onshore potential now, if you apply various layers, uh, various filters that we saw in the previous slide, which is an arable land, forest cover, water bodies, and we also consider a cutoff population density of 400 people per square kilometer. Here, by cutoff population density, we imply that it is not possible to, let's say, sequester CO2 in districts that have a population density higher than 400 square kilometers. Then we are looking at a constrained CO2 sequestration potential of about 317 gigahertz out of which about 90 gigatons is the offshore uh, sequestration potential, whereas the onshore potential is 227 gigatons. Now, just to understand you know, what is happening between the image on the left and the right, let us consider the case of the Indo-Gangetic plain, the states of Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, uh, you know, uh, Himachal Pradesh, and Punjab here. There is significant potential for CO2 sequestration in saline aquifers here, as you can see. However, since we are you know, considering a cutoff population density of 400 people per square kilometer and the Indo-Gangetic plain is indeed very densely populated area, it is not possible to sequester CO2 in, the, in that particular plain. Therefore, what we see on the image on the right is we are excluding the entire you know, sequ CO2 sequestration which is possible in saline aquifers in the Indo-Gangetic plain. And therefore, you know, 649 gigaton theoretical potential about 317 gigaton is the constrained or realistic CO2 storage potential. Now, you know, this is a very important slide here. What this slide shows is the CO2 storage potential on the y-axis as a function of the population density, which is a cutoff population density on the x-axis. And here we are showing three curves. The, the dark green curve, the top one, it indicates the total CO2 uh, sequestration potential in onshore reserves 
which includes wasteland, croplands, fallowlands, and plantations, plus offshore reserves, you know, the, the CO2 which can be stored in offshore reserves. The light green at the bottom, which is the second curve here, it indicates the total CO2 which can be stored in onshore reserves. And when we say onshore reserves here, we only limit ourselves to wastelands and croplands. And of course, we include offshore uh, storage potential. And the third, which is the, the, the gray curve that we see at the bottom, it includes onshore potential, which is in you know, a wasteland only, plus offshore potential, which is about 90 gigatons. Now, this curve, the, I think the top two curves that we see, they follow the classical F curve. So what here implies, what we what the curve shows is there, there are two inflection points. The first inflection point is here at a cutoff population density of about 400 people uh, per square kilometer, where the total sequestration potential is about you know, 280 to 317 uh, gigatons. Whereas if we consider the CO2 sequestration potential of about 200 people, uh, sorry, a population density cutoff of about, of about 200 people per square kilometer, then the CO2 storage potential reduces to about 155 to 174 gigatons. Whereas, you know, if we go around, you know, 80 people per square kilometer as a cutoff value, then the CO2 sequestration potential reduces significantly to about 100, 107 uh, gigatons. Now, moving from the CO2 sequestration potential to the timelines in which this, you know, sequestration uh, capacity can be realized, what we have done here is we have looked at various types of uh, CO2 sequestration reservoirs, you know, starting from oil and gas fields, which are very well understood to you know, saline formations or saline aquifers, which are you know, relatively less understood to basalts, for example, which for which we don't have any understanding as of now. And for these each type of sequestration reservoirs, we have looked at various activities that needs to be done before the actual CO2 injection materializes. And you know we are looking at you know various phases like for example pre-appraisal phase, initial technical appraisal, and all the way till infrastructure development. Now let's focus on the first category, which is you know the category one oil and gas fields, which are well very well understood because you know these are the oil and gas fields that are producing oil and gas today. Now you know things like pre-appraisal phase here they take about one year, whereas you know things like you know infrastructure development for example they take about five years. But if you look at it totality, right, starting from 2023, if we start, you know, if you want to start injecting CO2 in category one oil and gas fields, and, you know, uh, if we start preparations today, the earliest that it can actually materialize is about, you know, 10 years from now, which is 2033, because, you know, there are various phases that, that have their own timelines, and we have sort of tried to optimize, you know, and, you know, do activities in parallel, et cetera. But nevertheless, even for fields that are very well understood, we are looking at a period of about eight to ten years. Now contrast that with you know basalts, which are you know very well, uh, very not very well understood. Look at the pre-approval phase here in basalts, for example. We are looking at a timeline of about five years. And you know if you if we include everything, then that then you know the earliest that we can start with CO2 sequestration in basalts is you know 18 years from or 17 years from now, which is you know 20 by 2041. Also, likewise, you know, we have done a similar study for, you know, saline aquifers, uh, category two oil and gas fields, et cetera. And you know, the, the key messaging from this slide is that, yes, you know, we have committed to 2070 net zero, and maybe, you know, we want to use CCS, let's say, after 2040. But if we want to use CCS, you know, by 2040, then we have to make a start today. It cannot happen that we go ahead and, you know, start with uh, planning, et cetera, by 2035 or 2040, because then we'll be able to inject CO2 only by 2055 or 2060. And this is the last slide here, which is, you know, the, what are the key uh, policy recommendations from our study. The first is, you know, to assess and explore basalt resources on priority. Uh, this is, you know, basalt, as, as I mentioned in the opening slide itself, it's very important because, you know, India is one of the very few countries that is blessed with, you know, abundant uh, amount of basaltic, onshore basaltic resources, that is first. Second is, you know, unlike, oil and gas fields or, you know, coal fields where CO2 stored is stored in gaseous form, you know, and then it builds on to certain concerns over safety, et cetera. In case of basalt, CO2 actually, you know, mineralizes and gets converted into solid form. So as far as MRV is concerned, as far as safety operation, et cetera, are concerned, basalt has, you know, a little less challenges as compared to other fields. The second challenge is, you know, decarbonization. It, it presents significant business opportunities for uh, industries, but it also, you know, generate, uh, it also presents uh, you know, options for the government to generate revenue. So, for example, in oil and gas field, the government gets some royalty in terms of you know, the MMBT of natural gas, which is extracted, or the, the, the amount of oil which is extracted. 
Likewise, for CCS, the government can go for license acreage where the government can, you know, gain some revenue, $5, $10, $1, $1 for every ton of CO2 which is sequestered. Therefore, you know, this is business opportunity for the industries and, you know, uh, uh, a possible revenue generation for the government as well. The third is on, you know, the developing and up updating existing standards, etc. Now, this is very important because CCS as a whole is relatively new, you know, new field, new ecosystem for decarbonization. And, you know, there, there is a very strong need uh, to have those, you know, robust standards across the CCS value chain. That is the first aspect. And, you know, if you look at uh, permissions, for example, in NVR in environment uh, impact assessment, uh, there is no mechanism or no framework through or uh, which, you know, CCS projects can be given permission in India. Uh, likewise, you know, there is a need to develop a strong, uh, very strong and efficient MRV framework for, you know, uh, CO2 uh, sequestration, because, you know, there are concerns on the amount of CO2, which will be actually be injected underground and the amount of CO2 that comes out, et cetera. So the broadly, you know, these are, these are the challenges in terms of, you know, updating standards and regulations uh, on CCS. And finally, again, you know, as CCS is very new, and we saw in the previous slide, the, the amount of time which is needed uh, for CCS ecosystem to actually materialize, there is a very strong need to have a government, industry, academia, and also, you know, think tank collaboration so that the timelines which are needed for, you know, CCS projects, you know, anything between 10 years to 20 years, it can be squeezed significantly, uh, you know, to a manageable timeline. So broadly, these are the four policy recommendations that we have at our end. And now I'd like to hand over the stage to my colleague, Heyman, who can start with the panel discussion. Thank you, Deepak. Um, and for those who are interested, for those who are interested in listening, uh, sorry, going through our uh, research report, uh, we have pasted the link in the chat box. So feel free to uh, go to that link. You'll find our entire report, which has um, insights such as what uh, Deepak has presented and much more. Uh, so I guess we can now move on to our panel discussion. We have uh, three very interesting panelists. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mitra, Dr. Vishal, and uh, Dr. Firani. Uh, but before we jump into the discussion itself, I would like to you know, go through a brief introduction for each one of them. Uh, starting with uh, Professor Vikram Vishal, I think he's a very well-known space in this, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, known personality in this space. But regardless, you know, he's an associate professor at IIT Bombay uh, and holds a PhD degree jointly from IIT Bombay and uh, Monash University in Australia. He is currently also a visiting professor at MIT uh, Energy Initiative uh, and has pursued his postdoctoral research at Stanford University prior to that. Uh, currently also serves as a faculty at the US Department of Energy uh, sponsored program called the Research Experience in Carbon Sequestration. Uh, he's been doing that since uh, 2017. Uh, and finally, he's a convener uh, in India for the DSC sponsored National Center of Excellence in Carbon Capture and Utilization. Uh, which he hosts in uh, IIT Bombay. It's been going on since 2021. Uh, Professor Vishal specializes in uh, geomechanics, CCUS, and enhanced petroleum recovery. Uh, moving on to Dr. Firani. Um, she used to previously be in India and was an associate professor uh, at IIT Delhi in the Department of Chemical Engineering. Uh, she's currently a lecturer at the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Strathclyde uh, in the UK. Uh, she specializes in uh, theoretical modeling and simulations to characterize porous media and its implication in design and management of large-scale porous media. I hope I got that right. Um, and her applications uh, or her work focuses you know, on large-scale geological systems such as in hydrogen storage, groundwater remediation, CO2 sequestration, uh, geothermal energy, and oil and gas reservoirs. And finally, Mr. Mitra, uh, he's our... Uh, industrial expertise on the panel today. Uh, he works at uh, ONGC as a general manager and is heading the R&D activities in the Institute of Reservoir Studies um, in uh, Ahmedabad. Uh, he holds a postgraduate degree in applied geology from Jadavpur University and has more than 25 years of experience in the exploration and production uh, side of uh, upstream you know, oil and gas industry. His main expertise is in the area of enhanced oil recovery and CCUS. So with that, I think uh, we can begin our panel discussion. And Vikram, I would like to start with you. Um, you know, having said all that we did in our presentation, uh, there's a lot of new activity that is happening in India. So I would definitely want you to kind of start the discussion with, uh, you know, those uh, recent developments, but also maybe talk a little bit about 
how do we go about unlocking the ccs potential in india because like we saw uh, oil and gas you know yes we are looking at eor but has a very limited potential from a long term sequestration potential right so eventually we have to either look at basalt or silicon aquifers so how do we navigate this space given the large timelines that we are looking at thank you so much himant and uh, first of all congratulations to cw for the fantastic work that has come out of this uh, report you know i had the privilege of reviewing it at one stage so you know i am indeed aware of it uh, i'm glad that it is out you have covered the entire spectrum with very limited data that is available getting into this level of analysis where you are bringing down the constant potential is very very informative and uh, you know it will pave the way for you know, clear directions for the government and the industry to take forward some of the projects that they have been thinking about so yeah india i think the first thing which i can talk to uh, can mention about is the dst sponsored national centers of excellence at in uh, ccus uh, ccu at iit bombay and the other one at uh, jncs at bangalore and uh, the support that the dst has brought in for through various mission innovation and accelerating ccs technologies which is expediting the works on ccs in india uh, further to that we are aware that ministry of petroleum and natural gas where actually ongc was the, the coordinator uh, the dds the draft road map for ccs for upstream oil and gas companies which is also giving the short term medium term and long term uh, you know aspirations for accelerating ccs in the oil and gas sector second and thirdly uh, the minister of steel has now constituted a task force and they are looking at the capture as well as sequestration which also includes some of the potential for studies in in the basalt formation that you have talked about uh, then we are also aware of the uh, niti ayog's uh, the the uh, in the ccs policy frameworks that was released uh, last year i think november Uh, 2022 and that's also gives a comprehensive overview of the kind of direction that ccs has to proceed uh, in india so uh, more or less you know, this space is uh, fast tracking the r&d sector is expediting we know that most of the trls in india are at trl 3 4 with driven primarily by the r&d units of different companies and the institutions like iits and other csr la- labs uh having said this uh, the the point as you mentioned that oil and gas has a limited potential but it is still not as low as we may you know think i look at it when we compare with saline aquifers and basalts you are right it is low but then the oil and gas industry brings tremendous experience of uh, you know working and operating in the subsurface for several several decades and uh, you know that is what is needed in the first place to get the confidence of any ccs operations so so for example in the storage capacity estimate that we had made uh, somewhere around 3.4 gigatons and 3.7 gigatons of storage capacity in enhanced oil and gas recovery scenario and in an cbm recovery scenarios so now you look at the emission uh, point sources of emissions which are maybe 1 million ton per annum or to 10 million per ta- per annum even if they are capturing a million ton you know they can have hundreds of such projects you know uh, bringing in co2 which can be sent and you know each as each single field field can take several millions of tons of carbon dioxide so the initial confidence can come definitely by doing the eor operations but for the long term as you rightly mentioned uh, we have to get into the uh, the other type of resources like uh, like the saline aquifers or the basalt formation and uh, since you mentioned about the you know constraint potential i must say that it is fairly known that as per any resource pyramid the base of the pyramid is always wide and that's that's uh, you know because that's a theoretical estimation but from there you move to the feasible estimates and when you go to the matched capacities often the numbers are you know it has to be less in the pyramid but uh, you know the getting to these studies that you have presented is very very vital to get from the base step to the next step and look at these constraints so i think in all these reservoirs have their own uh, you know set of strengths and uh, uh, challenges but we should look at all of them you know holistically and look at which are the opportunities to go for to start with and then accelerate further yeah great you know yeah looking at all of them because i think every geography will have uh, its own set of uh, benefits looking at these different uh, resources which are you know different in different parts of the country uh, jyoti you know we are starting on eor probably sometime soon uh, but the us and europe have been doing it for decades now uh, and also there has been a lot of initiative on in looking at pure ccs meaning sequester and not worry about it sort of uh, you know um, projects so what's been the european experience you know thus far uh, especially on you know pure ccs plays and and what is the plan for the future you know is there confidence that yes this works and uh, is a potentially strong decarbonization option or is it still you know wait and watch mode <laughs> So I will talk about a bit of the US experience as well because I was in the US in an oil and gas company where I worked on 
EOR projects for CO2 enhanced oil recovery. So when you are talking about CO2 enhanced oil recovery, what they do is they inject CO2 and they produce uh, enhance the recovery of oil and some of the CO2 is produced back. But when we talk about oil and gas reservoir, we just shouldn't look at enhanced oil recovery because once the fuel is spent and we say that we cannot recover more oil, then those kinds of formation can also be used for storage, as you said. So that potential is much higher than if you look at the uh, storage potential of oil and gas reservoirs. And then talking about uh, its, uh, uh, European experience, so Europe has been at the forefront of this CCS. So Sleitner project, uh, if you are aware of, uh, has been injecting CO2 underground for decades. And it's still in a decade, it has not leaked. So there has been, so the uh, how it is migrating in the geology is being monitored and it, ha it has not leaked yet. So the potential is there, the safety is there. So we can go through it. And so what was your second question? I uh, Can you please repeat? Is the confidence that there should be many more of these? And can we yeah. look at it as a, you know, a potentially large solution? Because if you look at, uh, you know, hard to obey industries or power plants, you know, legacy ones, uh, there's clearly the debate on whether you should look at CCS or CCU or any other option. So how, you know, strong is the confidence in utilizing CCS as a credible option? So utilization can be only 10% of what we are emitting. So we emit 30 gigatons of CO2 worldwide and we can utilize only, I think, 300 million so it is only the utilization is very less so we have to go to sequestration so in scientific community that is very clear and uh, in Europe what I have seen is the scientific community informs the policy as well so uh, the policy is also driven by that sequestration has to be there and as Vikram said that we need to uh, take into account the knowledge that we have already with oil and gas industry so which is already being uh, taken into account and being uh, uh, recruited for ccs purposes so ccs is the solution for net zero you cannot utilize all the co2 that we are emitting so that is very clear in the scientific community but yeah the public perception has to change yeah, we'll come back to the public perception because that is yeah. one important aspect that feeds into policy as well. Yeah. Uh, but before that, Mr. Mitra, you know, you have been at ONGC for the longest, you know, duration. And I'm sure we have very good, uh, you know, domestic experience as far as oil and gas and coal is concerned. I'm sure it's very fungible with the whole EOR, uh, you know, process that uh, ONGC is taking up, you know, in the Gandhar fields. The question is how fungible is the experience when it comes to say sailing aquifers and basalt because eventually what also matters is transporting the co2 and that has a significant impact on cost so uh, you know although eor might be available but the source of co2 might be closer to say a basalt or saline aquifer so in you know going back to what vikram said earlier we will have to look at all the resources so how fungible are our expertise and experience when it comes to saline aquifers and basalt. Hemant, uh, I hope that you can hear me. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you so much. And uh, and many congratulations, Vikram has said, for the report, because I was also a part of that uh, review and had a meeting with you and uh, your colleague as well. So it's a wonderful report. We'd love to see it in detail. So, uh, and then come back to what, uh, I'll get back to your question a little bit later on about uh, basalt and experience in basalt and saline aquifer and uh, well completion technologies. But what is important in the Indian perspective is that, as we know that we are now importing more than 85% of our crude oil. Uh, and that has a huge impact on our foreign exchange reserves. And this is probably one of the, not probably the most uh, strategic challenge uh, we are facing as a nation because uh, we need uh, hydrocarbon as energy resource for uh, quite a bit of a time to come. And so uh, the, all the companies that operate in India, ENP companies operate in India, whether it's uh, private sectors or uh, public sectors, they are under tremendous pressure, rightly so, to increase production. 
and at the same point of time being a highest producer and longest uh, running uh, public sectors company np company in in india we have a responsibility to not to produce uh, uh, how much but how to produce that oil so that is one area that i i i would like to highlight that as a nation our first attempt effort should be to merge cc us not purely ccs and uh, cc us in the sense that co2 ur comes storage so that that has two two way benefit the first benefit is that you get whatever residual oil is left out and that every bit of oil we need badly need and and secondly uh, the cost of any kind of ensure injection and storage project injection from storage projects have a hugely cost intensive both in terms of uh, co2 capture transport compression injection then monitoring and uh, evaluations so these are the huge cost uh, impact so any company which is going to do it even uk us canada australia or those who are forefront of this project especially in norway as uh, um, uh, jyoti has talked about sleipner it's more than 25 years now started since 1997 they have a huge huge support for the government we cannot expect that support because our government has certain other priorities our social sector spendings and other priorities you can't expect that the government in uk and us and the norway and australia that kind of support uh, they could give it this kind of a project we can never dream of that at least as of now in the in the decades to come because we have some other more significant priorities uh, in our, our in our spending total budget now in this scenario in a company perspective at least in in a no profit no loss situation you can run the project that need to be understood for that you need to have some offset of the cost from enhancement productions both in terms of oil and gas or cbm egr or eor or ecbm i'm talking about and then you can do uh, the sequestration as well in the same reservoir as far as completely depleted oil and gas field which can only be used for storage we do not have as such because there are significant amount of oil left in the most of the fields and to make it abandoned as far as oil and gas production is concerned it's some some a, a decade or so to come few of the fields we have outlined that that will be ready for pure sequestration in another 8 to 10 years time but that work needs to keep on started from now so that we are ready after 10 years to start the project of injection now come back to the second priority the pure sequestration in basalt and selenic river that you are talking about this is the least challenging engineering wise engineering technology wise is the injection in basalt and saline aquifer where we already do not have any, any wells because the moment you talk about injection in in a mature field both in terms of ur comes sequestration as well as pure sequestration depleted oil and gas fields the process is that we understand the reservoir very well and we know the geology we know the structure we know what are the possible leakage points the biggest negative is that we have a significant number of leakage points all the injectors and producers that has been drilled over the years have become a weak zone so this is the negative part of it the positive part of it is our overall understanding about the reservoir geology as well as geomechanical part of it uh, of the reservoir now as we go to the saline aquifer and the and the and the basalt our understanding of the whole reservoir is poor because we do not have much data some in case of saline aquifer for basalt very very little data limited data but for all but technology wise it's not an issue to drill wells in basalt as well as in saline aquifer because there is no well if we can find out that work is in the from wengi side i can talk about that we are now uh, have a long term project with uh, with the institute that bikram headed a national center of excellence of ccu in iid bombay we are uh, working together we will be working start working together in detail in a, in a 3 to 4 years project to identify deep saline aquifers and and the basalt as well and do the detailed study starting from the characterization to uh, understanding the structure geology and geomechanics and 
and actually make it ready for the saline efforts or the basalt or ready for injection in another three to four years to come. And now th that is the first challenge to, to really have the storage potential understanding in saline aquifer and the basalt to the extent that we can really formalize a project which can be implemented. So that work will, some work has been started in ONGC, but the major work we, we will be doing with uh, Bikram and his team in Cent National Center of Excellence, hopefully you start in a month or so time. And it will take around three or three and three and a half years time. So that is the preparedness when you see is having apart from our own understanding about our already running oil and gas fields. So that data is usually available. Our understanding is very good. And Gandhar, we have shortlisted uh, for for an injection project and you are come uh, storage project for the first time. And uh, hopefully as it starts, our learning will grow and we can really go ahead with other projects. Now quickly go to the transportation size side. Transportation of CO2 has not happened in India through pipeline because uh, that, that ecosystem has not been created. As Bikram said that a lot of work at the, at, at the ideological level has been done and, and been documented in, in both the reports, draft reports of MOPNG as well as in the report is already issued by Niti Aayog. And uh, now it's a job of the ministry to come out with a certain amount of regulations, both in terms of uh, CO2 transportation, injections, or we are not allowed to transport and inject CO2 through pipeline in India. There is no policy under which we can apply and get the approval. For hydrocarbon, yes, there is a policy. There are certain regulations. So these are basic things that needs to be done apart from the business model, which, which comes later on. So uh, as of now, I stop here and I will uh, request all the other panelists to come in and express uh, their point of view as well. Thank you. Yeah, we'll, we'll come back to the business model because that is very important. But I think Vikram, uh, Mr. Mitra said it, uh, that the time to start is now. Uh, you know, So there is the you know, injection end, which is represented by U3 here. But then there's the other end, which is the source end. And businesses, when they're looking at CCS, from their perspective, it's not happening right now, at least in India. And they need some sense of clarity and comfort that it actually might work in India, right? Because their planning cycles are in the decades. Let's take steel industry, for example. They are now taking a decision on whether do they go with coal, but for that they'll need CCS, or do they go with natural gas or green hydrogen, et cetera. So clearly, uh, given you know the need for getting more information, gaining that knowledge and expertise, it's going to take at least a decade, if not more, uh, to the point where we can start injecting in these alternative resources. So how can we potentially squeeze the timelines? I mean, do you have a sense of you know uh, whether we you know it means sharing experience with other countries uh, or taking shortcuts if you know that's possible? You know what is possible in terms of squeezing the timelines? Yeah, thank you, Hemant. And, you know, um, I think I still go by the saying, when there is a will, there is a way. So, uh, and, and now we don't have too much of option of will, there are compulsions coming in, right? So uh, with the kind of constraints of climate and the commitment of uh, the Honorable Prime Minister at COP26 about net zero by 2070. Now you look at any of the scenarios that may have been studied, you know, CCS accounts for somewhere around 14 to 32 percentage of all the efforts and in achieving net zero, right? So uh, we can talk about hydrogen, which is also very important, fuel switch, which is very important, energy efficiency, which is very important. But, uh, you know, CCS is also a, an important word there and uh, you know as mr mitra rightly pointed out as you also summarized the time is right now and i think that's exactly why companies like ongc and many others you know are actually coming forward with a lot of efforts and in this direction a lot of work i'm sure they are doing internally uh, and, and understanding the space of both capture conversion transportation and storage uh, in since you mentioned the steel sector you know uh, you know we are also working with you know the, the tata steel limited and steel authority of india limited uh, to understand both the capture and the storage sides of the study uh, of, of the spectrum uh, uh, the ntpc is you know 20 ton per day CO2 capture plant that you you see uh, it's in vindhyachal that study was done by iit bombay uh, as a uh, first first stage 
change and then it was implemented later in that study also we looked into you know to like 60000 tons per annum of co2 capture so so basically this this space then that, that started some 5 years ago so i, I do understand you know many industries uh, arcelor metal steel just talking about the steel sector since you mentioned uh, they are all looking at pathways for decarbonization for steel sector we are somewhere around 140 145 million tons of co2 of sort of crude steel uh, you know uh, production today it is expected by end of this uh, decade it will be somewhere around 300 million metric tons of uh, crude steel so in that when you upscale this from there to there of course if we are not retrofitting the old plants with ccus at, for the next coming ones we can definitely explore both hydrogen as a reduction medium or uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, CCU has retrofitted totally. One of the works that we have also done is on carbon dioxide to carbon monoxide conversion. You know that iron ore, when it reacts with, you know, uh, carbon monoxide that comes from coke, it reduces iron ore to iron. And if you can actually capture the carbon dioxide and convert it to carbon monoxide, that carbon monoxide then reacts with iron ore and reduces it. So basically, the R&D space has to expand much more, much more and come up with solutions. And then it should not just remain at you know, lab prototypes. It has to scale up to a little bigger pilots and uh, demonstrations. And then you have to see which ones will be you know bigger. So that's where the support from different entities uh, come at, at this level. And that's where, again, national centers like ours become nodal to these kind of you know activities and, and many other you know institutions and organizations that are working on that. So the idea is that, you know, as also... Uh, Mr. Mitra very rightly pointed out the work that, that the understanding of the subsurface, the reservoir, is very, very well known. What we are also adding on to this is the value of the cap rock there, so that the containment is a major, major thing here uh, when we inject the carbon dioxide. And, and also, you know, very rightly pointed out that there are so many intersected wells in that reservoir. Which one is going to be the pathway for leakage? You don't know. So whether the wells that are intersecting the reservoir are closed and sealed properly, so these kind of studies will be very important. So uh, usually the timeline, as you said, is like some eight to ten years, you know, on an average for you no know, one operation. But when we are doing some this these things in parallel, then the timeline reduces from eight to ten to actually 20, uh, four to five years, or rather even less if there is a much more you know uh, you know human resource and knowledge that is brought into this. So I don't see that as a major challenge because it's it's, it's being done. It's being done around the world. We have those kind of partnerships with the, the mission innovation countries and so on. We can bring uh, this knowledge forward and and expedite. And the timeline needs to be shortened, and that will give the confidence for upscaling from one project, let's say Gandhar, for example, to many many such projects in in due course in time so i'm not very you know uh, uh constrained by that i think as i said when there is will there is a way yeah i think you are uh, one of the most optimistic and probably that's why you're the face of ccs in india uh mr mitra you know going back to the timeline issue i think often we tend to think in terms of timeline from the sink and the source perspective but the elephant in the room also is you know the pipelines taking the co2 from the source to the sink uh, and if if uh, experience in the natural gas space were to be taken as a bellwether, uh, it's very difficult to lay pipelines. Uh, and we are also challenged by the fact that it's a fairly large country uh, with industry, especially power plants and cement plants spread out across the entire geography. And so pipeline network will be essential and probably, uh, you know, will limit how quickly we can uh, accelerate the whole CCS process. So any thoughts on, you know, how can we you know, address that challenge of, you know, building a pipeline network, which can happen efficiently, and maybe like Vikram said, in parallel, so that we are looking at a much shorter time. Eman, the very interesting question. I tell you one story that uh, the, the how we land up in Gandhar, very quickly, that these all challenges were with us, because we lay pipeline day in, day out, and we, uh, as an organization, suffer a lot. A lot of our project gets uh, extended because of a pipeline and uh, delay in pipeline lane. Now, the purpose of selecting Gandhar is for two reasons. One big reason is that Gandhar, uh, we have injecting, we are injecting pressurized high pressure hydrocarbon gas since 1998. And the, the injection pressure is in the range of around 270 bar at wellhead, at wellhead. So, it's a very, very high uh, uh, pressure injection project that we have run uh, since 1998 and just closed in 2022. So we run it for 25 years without any accident. So, uh, so that was a huge amount of confidence that we have in Gandhar. And Gandhar has, has a depth which also favorable. It is uh, target reservoir is storage point as well as production point is more than 2,500 meters from the surface which is around 8,000 feet approximately. So that gives a huge uh, benefit. 
uh, and second is close proximity to sewer resource and third most important the pipeline we have selected the Kuali refinery because already we have a pipeline huge pipeline running from our CPF Gandhar to Kuali and we have a land use permission as well as right of way and right of use ROU LOU as uh, ROW in that stretch the complete stretch from Kuali to Gandhar so that is one reason that we selected uh, Kuali refinery as a source because at least for that point we the first pipeline that we plan to inject there will not be an issue of uh, right of way right of use and other things and talking about creating a uh, transportation network uh, i would rather say that we have a huge country we should go step by step uh, gujarat is a place gujarat and maharashtra which is highly industrialized a lot of co2 sources and the here if we create a hub like in U U uk and europe that's going for a hub system and clusters and hub systems and we create first one hub work for a one hub and then do a lot of experiments and ideas and then that learning can be shifted to other parts of india if we start thinking about the whole country we will be it will not it will be a non starter absolute non starter we must focus on western india both western offshore and western onshore and fortunately the basalt is also there uh, deccan basalt is there so even if you talk about basalt it will get there maximum amount of producing oil field are there lots of lots of industries in the both in the coastlines and other things are there and in the time to come we can use the transportation through coast as well and the ship transport that we I had a lot of discussions with uh, people in uh, uh, reliance people from jamnagar refinery uh, bikram is also part of that uh, so they had some feasibility study through uh, ship transport as well in the years to come so there are and we have a dahej port here we have a uh, port in jamnagar so these are all things connected the oil fields and the basalts and the saline aquifers we can create a hub first in western uh, india and do lots of all sort of experiments of both in the pipeline compression different modes of transport small project can use the bullet transport i mean container transport the the big project both landline as well as the coastline ship transport from jamnagar refinery producer of 6000 tons of co2 pure co2 no capture they emit in the atmosphere so that can be utilized so these are the opportunities lies in the western sector of india i think as a as a country uh, we should start with this have a create an hub system have a pilot kind of a semi commercial project in gandhar and take that learning and once we start injecting co2 lot of confusion gets over and you have to actually start walking to think of running you can't see and plan and plan and plan because there are a lot of challenges that you overcome once you face it so my i i i am fully with bikram there are much i believe there are much less challenges than you think before you start once you start the challenges comes and gradually get resolved because india as a nation was not blessed with lot of hydrocarbons but still we could do a, a field in developed a field like mumbai high in offshore mumbai high in offshore way back in 1974 so if there is a will there are in number of ways of solving it and i hope that with with a with the positive uh, things coming out from dst from national center of excellence that bikram is uh, is working on and there are other national center center of excellence that come with the times to come institute like yours and lot of scientists in different iits and other national institutes csl labs are working and when you see one challenge i face i tell you the, all of us those who are working in the rnd and really passionate about this subject as a is real challenge is that to convince the board level people the people who ultimately take a final call give a dotted a sign in the dotted line tell that go ahead so we have to bring them on the board and convince them that yes this is possible and with the times to come it can be a profitable business as well but if you want to make profit from the day one it's not going to happen 
and you would think that in a country like india government will support as the government of norway and uk and australia are doing that's a daydream and you can't expect that because they are they cannot afford that so you have to find out our own business model all the people can sit together and find out the solutions and and i can't go on detail here it will take a long time a lot of ideas and a lot of things can be can be discussed about and to start with not a not a profit making business no profit no loss kind of a situation to start with and then go ahead and evolve with a profit making business these are all stage wise approach step wise approach we can't start thinking of profit from the day one because it's not a profitable business as of now globally so uh, pure superstition i'm talking about so so in that way we should think and uh, that is my humble submission but this positivity and i can tell you that we can do it there is no doubt about that we can do it and uh, only thing is that some board level people need to be brought in i request that as the time comes up people like you it should like you invite some bigger shots but like those who sits in the board room as well because they move around globally in the different seminars and and make a lot of lofty promises but when come back to actually doing things there is a shaky leg so those are the they need to be given confidence and that yes it can be converted to a profitable business in the days to come not now provided you allow us to start the ball rolling actually in the field by doing starting injection so that is my submission you will come back to the business model because i think it all boils down to the money part uh, but before that jyoti uh, it's not like you know uh, we have our challenges but the west is free of nimbi issues uh, so you know clearly and maybe to a certain extent it's actually more in the west than it is uh, in india so how is it that uh, you know the ccs projects uh, have dealt with this issue but also more importantly you know in terms of giving confidence to the public uh through monitoring but also conveying the information that ccs is eventually a safe you know bet uh, how is that happening uh, in the european projects so about the com commercialization so there is an acorn project that is coming up in scotland and there is a humber one as uh, mr sujit mitra said that there is a cluster wise projects that needs to come up so humber zero project is the um, i think it is industrially in the uk it produces most co2 industrially and they are trying to develop that particular area as net zero first before going into the rest of the country so that approach is being used for uh, doing this ccs and uh, a con project for commercialization carbon credits are being used so i think india does not use carbon credits uh, till now but in not the yet. whole of europe yeah <laughs> yeah in the whole of europe this is because the co2 is sequestering is cannot be profitable you are just dumping down something in the geological reservoir you are not making anything so you have there has to be some incentive and carbon credit can be one of the way to uh have that incentive uh, to commercialize this and those carbon credits can be sold to countries which do not have uh, the capacity to store co2 like india has so those kinds of uh, things can be used for commercialization which are being used in the uk that i know and uh, for public perception as you said so for it is still a work in progress public perception because scientifically we understand that we can monitor it and the uh, the uh, the leakage uh, potential or the how harmful co2 can be can be divided in different stages like uh, what will happen when we are injecting there can be seismic activity uh, what can happen 10 years from now what can happen 100 years from now so this kind of approach is being used to educate the public so uh, other than that i mean uh, there is no way because co2 sequestration itself is cannot be commercial without the incentives provided by the government like carbon credits or something got it so you know let's i think uh, address the elephant in the room vikram uh, 
we can talk all about CCS being, you know, uh, technically feasible, but it all boils down to the money, right? Uh, and as of now, I mean, the estimates are all over the place, anywhere between sixty to ninety dollars per ton of CO2. Uh, it's an expensive affair because, uh, at least in India, we are battling energy efficiency, which actually, you know, makes money. Uh, so to go from there uh, to somewhere, you know, sixty to ninety dollar per ton is a tall order. But my question to you is, how do we squeeze that, you know, cost? You know, are there opportunities for us? Of course, EOR is one because you, you know, make a product, which is the petroleum. Uh, but there, are there other avenues to uh, squeeze down on the cost, to bring the cost down, especially in the Indian context, so that more companies and corporates can start thinking about CCS as a viable option? Thank you, Himan. Um, so, you know, I would try to keep it neutral but i might get uh, end up advocating myself uh, advertising myself so see r d is very important first example i'll give you is of direct air capture you know, uh, you know it's like 10 years ago when i attended classes of professor Klaus lackner you know he used to talk about direct air capture and giving a scale, sense of scale of co2 emissions in us almost 45 percent of emissions come from the diffuse point sources which is like the, the vehicles contrary to india we are where the industry and the is the major emitter compared to the diffuse point sources so uh, what happens basically it was somewhere around 800 to uh, 1000 dollars per ton of co2 captured around 10 12 years ago and this has been a matter of concern so when we talk about historic cleaning of the uh, the the atmosphere it has to account for the you know emissions that have happened in the last uh, you know centuries Right. So in that case, direct capture becomes very important. And since continuously working on this and then started projects started taking off, startups started coming up. And there it has come down to you know fairly you know, low amount, some of them claiming close to hundred dollars per ton, while the average for uh, you know, post-combustion, pre-combustion capture is around fifty-eight dollars per ton, global average I'm talking about. So you see that you know this R and D is very important to come up with new solutions. Now in R and D also like that this space has also kind of exploded in the last two three years, and there's a lot of solutions, and you get confused which one will go forward. That's where prototyping becomes important, and then doing the a complete life cycle analysis and technical analysis becomes very important to look at it coming to the commercial angle to it you know uh, this ministry of power this time in the g20 presidency ccs report uh, that has come out in february on february 5th that was released they have looked into the you know the the ngfs scenarios which is like the network for, network for greening of the financial systems so that's it is expected that investments are needed in the order of 70 to 80 billion dollars now uh, you know mr mitra talked about the project in gandhar so we know that these the projects are very expensive uh, you know capture is expensive transportation is expensive storage is expensive and also Jyoti, as she said if you talk about pure storage there's nothing coming out of it you have to you know just invest and uh, you know clean it but the cost of not doing it is bigger you know in terms of in, in in over the decades and for the generations to come uh, for for human life uh, we have had so many extinction of the biota that has happened because of this cha changing, you know, the sea level rising, and so many. I don't want to get into that again. So coming to the solution, there are several, you know, green financing that is available. For example, from the Paris Agreement, we know that there's, a, of course, this is more towards adaptation than mitigation. But then uh, that still needs to be strengthened by global financing. You know, countries like India would need that kind of, you know, financing support from around the world. And uh, then there are CCS trust funds of the banks like Asian and World Development Banks. Then there are climate investment funds that were that are also coming coming up. But the the amount of uh, funds that are there is minuscule, and it needs to be much much more. So the company countries who are actually you know, have historically polluted and also are continuing to emit much more than India in terms of per capita, they would re really need to contribute uh, for the global uh, sense of scale. And then a uh, simple example in this uh, multilateral development banks last, uh, I think, 2021, the total investment was somewhere around $80 billion, of which $50 billion went to the emerging economies. So this exchange has started to happen. This was not the case a few years ago. And, and as also Jyoti rightly mentioned to talk about carbon markets, so India is also now gearing up to talk about it. But the access has to be there for a global context, like the European Union emissions trading scheme. So I remember it was used to be ten dollars per ton to seventy dollars per ton when I was in, in a forum in Europe last year, and now it in February it crossed hundred dollars per ton. So so these are the changing times, and India should not lag behind uh, in any uh, circumstance. Then finally, I'll like to mention what everybody knows about is Tax Forty Five Q, which has incentivized CCU and CCS operations in in the 
in the in, in the US, right? And more so with the Inflation Reduction Act, which has brought in much more incentives for that. Now we look at direct air capture, which gets an incentive of $185 per ton. Some of the innovations that actually we are working on is, is not even going to be like $30 or $40 per ton from direct air capture. Now, if we were in US, we would be actually making huge amount of money from the incentives that are coming. So we cannot talk about that in India, but then the, the, as a global uh, entity, you know, uh, we can look at that. And finally, in the, we have to look at the international chains. There, I think I read somewhere that you know Japan is considering to like send its carbon dioxide to uh, Saudi to, so that they can do EUR out of that. So those kind of international exchange of CO2 is also going to happen. I read one uh, nice paper in uh, resources conservation and recycling last year where some of the colleagues from neighboring countries have also looked how India can actually look at you know both way becoming a storage hub and bringing CO2 from outside or if there are hubs nearby sending CO2 but that financial mechanism has to be worked out. Yeah, thanks Vikram. Yeah, reverse export is something that we have also talked about. And Mr. Mitra, one of the things we have suggested is why not make the whole thing commercial and give out licenses for acreage like we do in oil and gas? Because although we produce petroleum, here maybe might be the reverse case where we import CO2 and you know make money out of it. So that's one, of course, business model that we could think of. But are there other avenues where you can monetize uh, you know, or create business models that might make the whole project commercial? Any thoughts there? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, the, the first point that you mentioned that giving the acreages for the storage uh, that uh, that Norway has started uh, uh, last year onwards that uh, they have actually started giving acreages like our OLP and HELP kind of a thing. And so uh, the basic thing is that uh, that we started thinking and that mentioned in the MOPNG report as well, we are to create a basic storage atlas for India that, uh, but those, we, we actually suggested in that report that responsibility lies with the, the operating acreages, within the operating acreages that that company, particular company with the WNGC, YL or Vedanta, uh, they should work and the other areas, the DGH should take the responsibility and they should fund this kind of a project. WNGC as a company, Oil India as a company and uh, DGH as a, as a government entity to to, uh, uh, to the institute like National Center of Excellence, um, IID Bombay, or other National Center of Excellence, or some CSR lab which is willing to do this and develop certain expertise in this area, in collaboration with the uh, oil and gas companies because they have a lot of software access and and the laboratory uh, facilities which to build in uh, in a in a year or so is become quite cost intensive. So public private uh, kind of a uh, r and is the need of the hour as vikram has said without r and nothing can go forward move forward and secondly yes capture cost is going to come down drastically that we can see that huge amount of effort globally is in progress and uh, and capture technology is evolving uh, i mean very fast in fact, uh, in a Gandhar project, we have, they have the, the com Japanese company suggested in a small scale capture for the membrane technology. So, which is is to come in a large scale. I mean, it has tasted uh, in a small scale with the success. It can be done in a large scale apart from the amine based technology and other technologies. Uh, I know that IOCL uh, uh, R&D uh, team is working on that uh, in different other technologies. In, using bioengineers or other in collaboration with other companies in the world. So capture cost, I'm dead sure that is going to come down drastically in the years to come, depending on the source, of course. I mean, if you look at the Indian context, thermal power plant, steel plant, these are the main uh, point sources. As Vikram said, the diffuse sources are much, much less in India. It's basically point large industrial point sources. So that gives an advantage. That is an advantage, and those the, the all the capture that is major work is being done to capture from this point sources. Apart from the direct air capture that US and other advanced nations are working on. Now come back to next cost, which is the transportation cost. Transportation cost as such is not a big deal. Uh, I, I tell you that can be managed with a public-private partnership. If you can lay a pipeline, dry CO2 transportation is dry CO2 is not corrosive. So hydrocarbon transportation, normal gas transportation technology is known all over the world. I don't think that CO2 transportation could be a big hindrance cost-wise. Cost-wise, it can be hindrance with the right of way, right of use and other things. But cost-wise transportation, I am not going to see much challenges, at least land transport. 
Now come back to the cost and, and, and injection. There are different aspects of it. I will seeing the positive side of it. Cost and injection part is the compression, which is bare minimum. It's not that can be manageable. Now, monitoring and other things, uh, which is also, a, as of now, it's not a big deal. Once the regulation comes up, we can find out what, what are the things that need to be taken care of, apart from the technical part of it. There is there has to be some legal angle as well. The biggest challenges is the cost part, the cost of the CO2. Today, as we can say, there are $58 on an average uh, CO2 cost, uh, capture cost. So if it comes down to around $15, $20 per ton, I'm talking about refineries, steel industry, cement industry, and uh, uh, thermal power plant together. So if they can come down, which is eminently possible, I believe in another three to four years time, it can come down to a level of $20 per ton, $20, $25 per ton, if the capture plant size is larger. So uh, only thing is there that pure sequestration uh, to motivate that you have to bring out this either emission trading system like you, you that is successfully done or some carbon tax. I mean, these are the things that has to be come in. Otherwise, there is not even cost offset because companies might be might be doing ready to agree, uh, do it, no, no profit, no cost basis. But at least you have to make the expenditure both CapEx and OPEX offset so that that company cannot go bankrupt. So that is to be taken care of and that can be taken care of in two ways. One is the bringing out this either model, ETS model or or carbon tax model, cap and trade or uh, carbon tax. Another is that international club, uh, financing. And the third is little bit of support from the government, which I believe in Indian case will be less. So these three basket and R&D come together. I think this is eminently possible. Eminently possible. So you have to think in this way, all the sectors capture, transport, compression and injection and monitoring. These are the five uh, tenets where there will be expenditures. And each and every aspect, there's a lot of work is going on. I believe that that can be managed. Only thing with that, some amount of climate financing and uh, uh, government support and the motivation to the companies, uh, carbon tax in case, and motivation to the companies to do something for the future. Yeah. Companies are not built to make profit all the time. They have their certain social responsibility and it's not a social responsibility, it's a responsibility to make the planet livable for the years to come. So I don't think it's a social responsibility, I, I take it as a moral and ethical responsibility. So in that angle, if we bring out all those angles together and the pe people in the top sit together, I think it can be eminently done within a, another five years time. So that is my submission. Thank you, Mr. Mitra. So finally, Jyoti, we are over by almost uh, nearly 10 minutes. So the last word to you, uh, you know, Mr. Mitra said social responsibility, moral responsibility, uh, you know, the, the developing countries were, uh, you know, promised $100 billion per year for mitigating carbon. I am not very hopeful of that uh, materializing, but I think what might be possible is knowledge sharing, sharing experience. So, you know, what are the avenues for collaborating where, you know, just that knowledge and experience helps us here in India and probably in the developing world accelerate the whole CCS uh, ecosystem. Um, so last word to you. Yeah. So the uh, collaboration can happen at many levels. As we all are saying that R&D is important for that, there are different avenues that uh, we can collaborate on. There can be informal, formal collaboration and on different parts also like a public private partnership or what kind of uh, uh, schemes are working in the UK for that uh, collaboration can be there. Private companies can collaborate. There are different projects that are now floated by uh, UK and Europe government for which uh, students or faculty members can apply. And uh, so the, the uh, that informal partnership is always open. So there is uh, no harm in just mailing somebody and trying to reach out 
to, to say uh, what is going on and then trying to collaborate on R&D level. So because I'm an academic, I work in that space, I can say that uh, people are very open and uh, that, that venue is always open. Other than that, uh, getting direct funding from government to come here to see what is happening for at industrial scale. So that venues will keep coming up and they are still going on. Thank you. Thank you to all the panelists. Thanks, Jyoti. Uh, hopefully, you know, we will be able to accelerate our own ecosystem uh, with the help of, you know, the likes of you in other countries. Uh, thank you all for uh, participating today. I do see there are a few questions, but we are really over time. So I request you to just uh, email it to me and then I'll be happy to share it with the relevant uh, panelists today. Uh, thank you, everyone, and have a good day. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank everybody. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.